I'd like to welcome you all here to the Chalberg Theater. Uh, and on behalf of the entire board of the Rosemeyer Center for State and Local Government, I, I really am excited to have all of you here this evening uh, uh, for this evening's forum. I'm Greg Blaine. I'm the president of the board for the Rosemeyer Center for State and Local Government. And at this time, I'd like to introduce uh, Steve Wenzel, uh, the executive director and, uh, and a professor here at Central Lakes College. Uh, to introduce our, our very special guest this evening. I am very pleased and honored to introduce to you tonight the Minnesota State Demographer, Susan Brower. As Minnesota's state demographer, Brower directs the Minnesota State Democra Demographic Center located in the Minnesota Department of Administration. She travels the state talking with Minnesotans about the new social and economic realities brought about by recent demographic population shift. Her work applies an understanding of democratic, demographic trends to changes in a range of areas, including the state's economy and its workforce, K-12 education and higher education, and immigration and rural population changes. Susan Brower joined the Minnesota State Demogra Demographic Center under her predecessor, Tom Gillespie, who served, I think, 30 years as state demographer. Prior to that, she worked in research at the Wilder Research in St. Paul and at the Population Study Center at the University of Michigan. I believe Susan Brower's presentation tonight will show how Minnesota's 2020 census results are the driver of everything, from legislative and congressional redistricting to population shifts, rural and urban, and affecting the economy and education and many other areas in our state. Without further ado, it is my distinct honor to introduce to you tonight Minnesota's state demographer, Susan Brower. Thank you very much. Oh, hi, everyone. It's good to see you. <laughs> um, so what my formal bio doesn't say, thank you for that nice introduction. Uh, I'm also the mom of a couple of uh, snarky teenagers. I have a 16-year-old and a 19-year-old. Um, the 16-year-old, he just turned 16, so he's not yet driving. So I'm also, my other main job, but I'm not being a demographer, is to drive a child around to various soccer games and events. So that's me. I am going to talk about the census uh, tonight um, and talk about what we learned from the 2020 census. Uh, I'll talk about the population shifts, what happened a little bit with redistricting. Uh, but one of the reasons why I like demographics, why I'm, I was drawn to it, I, was, I was, came to it later in life, <laughs> but when I was in graduate school, um, I was taking a class in demographics. I was almost 30 years old at the time and uh, realized just how powerful demographics can be. If you understand and focus in on them, you can really have a pretty clear view of the future for a lot of things. Demographic trends are gonna keep unfolding regardless of whether or not we acknowledge them or are aware of them. So it really can be very helpful for a lot of people to understand kind of where we are and where we are going with respect to some of these trends, what they mean. So in addition to sharing the results from the 2020 census, I'm gonna talk a little bit about where our demographics are going and what that might mean for some of the changes in our state and in our communities going forward. Uh, I also wanna learn from you tonight. I'm really excited to take your questions and to hear about your experience in this part of the state, in the central region of the state, uh, I want to hear how some of these data relate to what you see happening or, or kind of what you think about it um, here on the ground. So uh, please uh, do share that with me when, when the time comes for that as well. Okay. 
So what did we learn from this last census? Uh, Minnesota does pretty well in terms of population growth uh, over the last decade. We're shown in kind of a light color green there, which means we actually grew. Um, the very darkest states grew the most. So you can see Texas, Nevada, some of the southwestern states, very, very dark green. North Dakota, very dark green. That means in percentage terms, those states grew tremendously. We're just about the national average in terms of growth, but it's really pretty hard for Midwestern states to grow. We kind of are in this belt of, of states that tend not to grow quite as fast. We don't have as many people moving here, so we don't have that extra boost from migration that other Southwestern states have. Uh, but you know, this 7.6% growth was just a hair above the national average. So generally, I'd say we do OK for ourselves with respect to growth. A lot of that has to do with the fact that we have large and growing metros uh, in the state of Minnesota. That's not true of all Midwestern states. Um, and, and that is what tends to lead growth, our metropolitan areas. But as you can see, you know, the state of Illinois is shown there in yellow. It actually lost population, even with the city and, and whole metropolitan area of Chicago. Um, it was a very small loss, but they actually lost population um, over the decade. So it's not a given that a state is going to grow. And in fact, as birth rates fall, as we see less migration, um, this is something that can kind of happen to, to many states. So the first reason why a census is taken, it's in the Constitution, uh, is, is for political apportionment and for political representation. So the reason why we do this in the very, this huge undertaking in the first place is to make sure that our representation is fair given the most recent demographics. Um, and so that's kind of the first purpose, and I'll talk a little bit about what happened after the census numbers uh, began to come out. The census is also used for funding. Billions of dollars rest on the headcount that is taken every 10 years. Uh, federal funds, state funds, all kinds of formulas are tied into the census. So it's really important with respect to that. Um, and then we use it for all kinds of analysis as well. I'm gonna focus mainly today on the political uh, reapportionment and redistricting and then uh, look ahead to some of those trends that I talked about. Those are 26 little people up here on the screen. <laughs> and it was 26 people counted in Minnesota that allowed us to keep our eight congressional districts just by 26 people. So of a state of 5.7 million, had we not counted those, I, I put them together as if they're in households, <laughs> just a handful of households, we would have instead had seven congressional districts in Minnesota rather than eight. And this was a really motivating factor for a lot of people, especially in greater Minnesota, where congressional districts tend to be quite large. There was a lot of um, concern that we would lose this seat, uh, and we almost did, just, just by a very small number. So had we lost our eighth congressional seat, uh, we would have had to have split up our 5.7 million into seven districts, as you see here. And so our districts would have been considerably larger, almost 100,000 more people for each district had we not held on to it. This is something that in 2010, we were very close to losing as well, not as close as we were in 2020, but it's something that Minnesota has just barely held on to for the last 20 years, and we'll see what happens uh, in the future. So what happened specifically to, I'm gonna come around here, wait. I don't know if you'll be able to hear me. I'll stay here so you can hear me. <laughs> so what happened uh, to this district, you can see um, on the right hand side, uh, looking specifically at the seventh and eighth congressional district. Uh, on the right hand side, we see what was the district before the 2020 census, that which was drawn in 2012. And you can see that for district, uh, congressional district eight, it kind of goes straight up the middle of the state and splits um, Indian reservations kind of 
uh, into two separate um, into two separate districts. And so what the courts did this time around, when they did their redistricting of seven and eight, was to really focus on keeping uh, the, the native and indigenous communities together, even though they're from different tribes, different reservations, uh, they made sure that the White Earth um, and Red Lake reservations were included in eight as well. And so in order to do that, they had to shift um, the, a portion of that district, um, District 8, uh, to the east a bit in order to kind of expand it out to the west. So that was the decision that was made. I'm sure there was more to it, but I know that that was one of um, a, a major point of interest is to keep communities of interest together. And so I know that that was part of something that community members were pushing for was to keep some of those uh, native tribes all in one um, in one district, and so that's that's one of the changes that we saw this time around. In general, I'll say, um, well, I'll, I'll show you the growth numbers. But in general, what we saw um, is a restriction uh, that the geographic areas, the geographic uh, districts in some of our metropolitan areas, particularly the Twin Cities, shrunk because those populations grew. And so to keep them the same size as we saw all the congressional districts have to be um, that ideal population or as close to it as possible, that 713,000. Some of those districts in the Twin Cities metropolitan area had to become much smaller. And then the, the districts in greater Minnesota that had less growth uh, needed to expand to encompass the same number of people. Now we're looking at what actually happened in terms of growth. And so we're looking county by county at the state of Minnesota. And where you see blue counties, it means those counties grew. If it's a dark blue, it means they grew a lot in percentage terms. And if it's an orange county, uh, they lost population. And so what we saw this decade is very, very strong growth in the Twin Cities metropolitan area, but also up along the I-94 corridor towards St. Cloud and continuing on toward, you see kind of this dark um, county, Clay County on the western edge of the state. That's where the Fargo-Moorhead metropolitan area is on the Minnesota side. Um, you can see kind of in the southern part of the state that there's a dark county that's Olmstead County where Rochester is. And in the Central Lakes region as well, we see growth up through that corridor through the central kind of um, central part of the state expanding northward. Um, and these were the high growth areas in the last 10 years. The areas that are shown in red or even in gray <laughs> Um, didn't grow as much, much. They actually lost population uh, in terms of the orange ones. Um, and most of those are more rural counties. And so um, this is kind of a longer term trend that extended into this uh, period as well. One more way to kind of look at that, the difference in growth across the state is to show you 87 bubbles. These 87 bubbles represent each of these 87 counties here. And you can see that uh, Hennepin County added about 120, huge blue bubble, <laughs> added about 130,000 people. Um, all of these large bubbles plus um, Olmstead County, Wright County, um, these are our high growth areas, mostly in the Twin Cities. Again, about 78% of the state's growth was in the Twin Cities, seven county metropolitan area. But another thing that I want to point out is that um, where there were population losses, you see those red bubbles, those are counties that lost population. They're relatively small losses. So the size of the bubble represents how many people were lost in each county. So where the places where that happened, it wasn't like a mass exodus of folks. Uh, it was more like a small kind of a trickle. Oftentimes, people will look at these numbers and they'll say, our minds just do this because we're people, right? So we put together a story of what's happening here. We say, well, people are leaving rural areas. It's young people. They're leaving. Part of that's true. Uh, we see migration from rural areas when people go to college. That's, you all know this story. <laughs> 
Um, but really what's happening, the main driver of population change in those areas is population aging. So you have older populations, you have older folks in high mortality age groups is my very sterile way of saying they are living in their communities and then they are dying in their communities. And that is very, very hard in rural areas when you have an older population. It's really hard for a community to grow because you have so many people who are in those older ages. So I guess, you know, when you're looking at some of these patterns, some of it has to do with people moving to, moving from, moving within the state, but a lot of it really has to do with who are the people who are living there right now, and, you know, they're just living their lives throughout, you know, in their home communities, uh, and that's what's producing some of this population change, is just kind of the natural um, end point of aging, uh, which is, of course, passing away to the great beyond. So. Got lots of metaphors in there for that. <laughs> okay, so let's look a little bit at what happened right here uh, in the Brainerd area. Um, you can see what was uh, the district uh, before re this last cycle of redistricting, um, Senate District 10 here, it's in light green. That means that that area grew fairly well. The lighter colors that you see here means that it was it, it didn't grow as much or there were some losses. But this map will show you that the districts, the Senate legislative districts for the state of Minnesota that had to change the most because of population change. So where you see the very darkest areas, it means that there were so many people that that either were born in those districts or moved to those districts that those are the ones that needed to contract. And where you see the very lightest colors, those districts needed to expand because there either was population loss or um, somewhat of a, a, a slower growth relatively. And then what the uh, court panel eventually did was take what was the 2012 uh, district of, of Senate District 10, and I pointed out right where Brainerd is there, um, and split it into three different districts. Um, and you can see that now it's part of six, 10, and seven. Um, and so that's kind of where they landed um, after the redistricting process. I was gonna show you a little live map, but I'm just gonna leave it to you. If, if you're interested in these slides, we can send them off and you can, uh, you can look at them later if you're nerdy like me and like looking at maps, but it'll show you exactly which communities grew over the last 10 years relative to others. And I'd say in this area, in, in Brainerd in particular and Baxter, you'll see kind of larger circles representing more growth, considerably stronger growth than many other areas in, in greater Minnesota, as we saw in a, in a prior map. So far, I've been talking about changes between 2000 and, or 20, 2010 and 2020, and I've been doing that because we're talking about the 2020 census. But of course, there have been massive changes since the 2020 census. Um, and some of what has happened since the 2020 census with the pandemic, we don't know what the impact of that is yet. So we've had these very stable growth patterns over time where we know there's high growth in the metropolitan areas, in center cities. We know the metro areas across the state have been growing strong over the last 10 years. But what happened once everyone was disrupted from their regular work lives? Um, we have some sense from new data that growth may have picked up in this area. In particular, since the pandemic, the average growth rate for Crow Wing County, for example, was about six tenths of a percent over the course of the last decade. And the most recent estimate has it almost three times that at 1.7%. Everywhere I go in the state, in greater Minnesota, people are telling me, no, people moved after the pandemic. <laughs> They're saying, we know people who moved. They moved either to their lake homes or they picked up their homes maybe in a more urban area. They moved out to where it's beautiful because they weren't connected in the same way that they had been to their workplaces. So we don't have a lot of evidence uh, about the extent of that yet. We don't have a lot of data that tells us exactly how much movement happened 
but we do know kind of just looking at the patterns here that we're seeing slightly different patterns that than we saw before uh, 2010. Another thing that we learned from the 2020 census is how our state is becoming more racially and ethnically diverse. And here you can see kind of the uh, BIPOC or black indigenous people of color groups uh, that have grown the most in the last, oh, since about 1990 is when most of the growth has happened. And we've seen the most growth in the last year statewide among black or African American populations in the state, followed by Hispanic or Latino and then Asian populations. Um, that black or African American inclu includes both US born African Americans and it includes newer African immigrants. So there's kind of a, a boost to growth there from immigration in that particular group. And jointly today, those groups total uh, just over 1.3 million or about a quarter of our state's population. Um, just, under, just under about a quarter of our state's population. When we look at the last census, we saw that the state's white non-Hispanic population began to decline. 51,000 fewer white residents in Minnesota in 2020 than in 2010. And then the state's population was fully, the, the growth population was fully attributable to BIPOC populations where we saw a growth of about 454%. So of the 400,000 people that we added, we added about 450,000 uh, people from the BIPOC community. Those are both births and immigration. And then we lost about 50,000 white non-Hispanic residents. And again, our heads go to people moving right away. This is largely white, non-Hispanic, older residents who are passing away rather than people who are migrating away, although there's some of that too. Uh, but that's the, that's the primary story. And if we look at a map, the, the areas with the kind of aqua colored bubbles, they're showing you areas that have lost white, non-Hispanic residents. And you can see that many areas across the state that are more rural, that are older, correlate with some of those areas that have lost uh, white non-Hispanic residents. So what we are seeing and what we are in experiencing in many of our communities across the state is this diversification of the state that includes uh, more diverse people being born at the younger ages uh, and, and older white non-Hispanic residents uh, passing away at the old at the older ages. Is this so depressing for you? You're like, come on, enough about death. That's part of what we talk about. Sorry. <laughs> um, just want to finish and talk a little bit about what's happening here more locally. We're looking at the Crow Wing County data here, and you can see that this county grew by about 3,600 people, which was pretty good growth for a non-metro, what's designated as a non-metro area. That's really quite a strong growth rate outside of a, me a major metropolitan area. Um, and here, unlike many areas of the state, the white non-Hispanic population continued to grow. Um, that didn't happen everywhere else, but most of the growth was attributable again to the BIPOC population. The proportion of people of color in Crow Wing County is still much lower than the state overall, but it's growing. You can see it went from about 4% in 2020 to about 7%. Again, that number in the state overall is about 24%. So kind of moving in the same direction, but still much less diverse than um, Minnesota overall. And then kind of bouncing back to statewide numbers, we're looking at the state's population displayed on a population pyramid, which means, I'm gonna get a pointer here. Down here are zero to four year olds. And those folks are our very cutest members in the state, I'm quite sure. There's some, cu there's some cute people up here too, but these guys are really pretty cute. 
But you can see as we go down further and further, we have much more racial diversity. And that's part of what we know will make our state more diverse in the future, is that we have more people of color who are of parenting ages, and um, they will have more children of color. Um, and as these bars kind of move up in age, we'll continue to see more diversity just because of this age structure. So it's kind of built into our demographics that regardless if we have no immigration moving forward, it's just those of us who are here now will be here in 50 years, we would still come out more diverse just because we are, the way that we're structured is to have more diversity at the younger ages and there's some momentum to that. Okay. So I've talked about what happened, a little bit about what happened with the census, what happened with redistricting. We talked about where populations were growing, uh, how we were becoming more diverse. I wanna look at workforce, and I wanna look at workforce as it relates to population aging, because this is something that I can guarantee you will impact everyone in this room and probably already has. Um, we're looking again at this graph that's like a population pyramid, but this time instead of looking at diversity at the younger ages, I want you to look at this little bump here. What's that little bump? Those are the baby boomers, <laughs> that's right. And so if you think about this graph as, it, as if it's an escalator and everyone moves up a bar every five years, and everyone moves up a bar every five years, you can see that the largest part of the baby boom generation still has yet to move above that 65-year-old age mark. Some baby boomers have already moved into their retirement years, but we still have a whole lot of them in their 50s who have yet to move up above age 65. And if we think about kind of where the baby boomers are on this timeline, it tells us a lot about what we will experience in the future as communities and as a state. The first baby boomer, the oldest of the baby boomers, uh, born in 1946, reached retirement age or age 65 in 2011. So that's when we started seeing more retirements, when that big generation reached that age. We are 11 years into that transition. We've had a heck of a lot of retirements in the last 10 years. And employers, let me just ask, of people in this room, who is responsible in some way for staffing or hiring, or has been responsible for staffing or hiring in any kind of capacity? Are there any folks like that? Yeah. So if you're doing it currently, and it's gotten a lot harder lately, <laughs> there's good reason for that. And one of the major reasons for that is because we're starting to see retirements happen. But the main takeaway is that we have a lot more retirements to come. We have another 10 years to come of people who will be moving up in, above that 65-year-old age mark. So even though the world has kind of changed in terms of the people available to work, and we'll look at that more in a second, there's still a whole lot more to come. In the future, even further out than the next five, 10 years, the baby boom generation will reach their 80s, and then some of the issues related to health care, long-term care, and paying for public services related to long-term care will really become important as well. That, I think, is really going to hit us as a state and as a community out a ways further past 2025 or 2030 when that really starts to pick up. But right now where we are feeling the transition of the baby boomers retiring is in the workforce. And I want the young people in the room to pay attention to this because this is good news for y'all. Um, the green line is showing you the number of people who are of working age. And you can see in the 70s and 80s and the 90s, it was growing like nuts. Employers could post a job posting and unto them would come an array of applicants and they could choose who they wanted from this array of applicants. We are at a very different point now. 
We are at a point where in 10 years in this state, we are likely to have the very same number of people that we have here today of working age, and in 20 years and in 30 years, which means that some of the workforce shortages that we're experiencing right now as employers are not going to be resolved through growth like they have been in the past. There's no massive growth. There's not a big boomlet of 12-year-olds that are just about to age into their working years. That's not coming. So what that means for employers is they're likely to see workforce shortages into the foreseeable future, assuming that we continue to have uh, a, a economic growth like we've seen in the past. Employers almost want to put their heads down on their tables when I'm sharing these numbers with them and cry a little bit because it's been tough for the last 10 years. Well, it's probably been the last five years. It's gotten really tough uh, to find employees. And this is across the state. This is in all industries. But young people, this means a lot of opportunities for you. Some of the narratives that you hear about how difficult it was when I had to go out and get a job in 1994, <laughs> this is a completely different picture today. Uh, people are getting hired so quickly. If you have a skill that employers need, the match will be there and the match will be there very, very quickly. It's, it's much less a game of chance. So if you can do your part to pick up on those skills that you know are in demand, you will have no trouble um, choosing the type of work that you want uh, moving forward. But that skill part has to be there. This picture is even more difficult in some areas of the state than in others. And you can see in particular in the, the fifth district where we are now, that green district corresponds to the five down here. It's not that the workforce will stay the same, it's actually begun to shrink, and it's projected to continue to shrink in the future. And again, that's just because there's not enough babies being born to make up for the folks who are retiring. And we can't go back in time and ask for more babies to be born. In the future, we're really just gonna have to align to what these realities are. Right now in the state of Minnesota, there are 214,000 job openings and there are 93,000 people looking for work. There are so many more jobs than there are people right now. <laughs> you can see that during the Great Recession, this is about 2008, there were somewhere around 25,000 job openings and about 250,000 people were looking for work. So this mountain declined since the Great Recession. We had fewer and fewer unemployed people, fewer and fewer people actively looking for work, and we had more people, or more job openings over time. During the pandemic, there was this kind of spike in unemployment, and there were fewer job openings for a bit, but we've come back to this point where we have this massive surplus of jobs relative to uh, workers. So if you put together this picture in your mind, the fact that there are a surplus of, of 100,000 jobs right now in the state, together with the fact that we are not likely to grow much more in terms of the number of people available in the coming years, this means that we are going to have to create some new ways of doing things in order to keep some of our businesses moving, in order to keep um, some, especially some of our essential services like health care, uh, care of the elderly, um, many of those things, you know, education, some of those things in the past that we just have had the people for, we're going to have to think really carefully about how we continue given this uh, new kind of reality. What might change the picture? Even immigration, while it might help us a little bit, in the past it really hasn't been our friend too much here. And that's because we tend to lose more people to other states than we gain. Year over year, and that's the kind of gray bars at the bottom here, you can see how many people on net we lose each year because we've lost people from all the movement around the US. 
And the blue bars are showing you how many people we have gained because of international immigration. In the most recent uh, data point 2021, we only gained about 5,000 people because of international immigration. It was very, very low because of COVID. But even on the best of years, <laughs> we gained 15,000 because of international immigration. Um, not all of those were people who were coming to work. Some of them were children. Uh, some were coming as uh, students in college or university. So this is every possible person who came to the US on net. We only gained 15,000 people. If we consider that maybe half of them were here to work, we're really only adding, because of international immigration, about 7,000 people each year. And think about that 200, that, that 100,000 surplus of, of jobs that we have. It's going to take a very, very long time if we're going to look specifically to immigration at the rate that we're going right now. We just won't meet it if we're talking about the same levels of immigration that we've had in the past. We won't meet those employer needs anytime soon. It's a very, very long way off. Um, in terms of losing people to other states, this is another one of those things where people's story, they're, they're, the stories in their head go right to what they've heard or maybe what makes sense to them. That's great, do that. Um, but what I will warn you is I often hear about people talking about taxes and are people moving away from Minnesota because of taxes. I'm sure there are some people that move away. We, we've heard of people, we've heard from people directly that move away from uh, Minnesota because of taxes. But the people who are doing most of the movement away from the state and to the state are 18 and 19 and 20 year olds. They're going to college, they're going to ski in Colorado, they're, you know, they're doing what 18, 19, 20 year olds do when they, they move. And so I just show you this to show you that when we're losing folks, it tends to be people who are in their teens and 20s. Some of them come back when they've graduated from college, but not all of them. We tend to kind of have this net loss over time. And then finally, I just wanted to point out that moving forward, what we have seen is increased educational attainment of the population. I know that's a topic of interest to some of you here. We have, over the past 10 and 20, and, and even beyond what we're looking at here, seen increased uh, um, educational attainment. We've seen an increase in the skills of, of our residents here in Minnesota. And we already um, you know, began fairly uh, highly ranking, and we've stayed that way. We're ranked about 11th in terms of educational attainment here in Minnesota. So that is something that I think will serve us well in this tight labor market. It's a good thing to have people who are, who are highly skilled um, when you have very slow economic growth otherwise. So to kind of wrap up our, our labor force discussion, and then I wanna to turn to you and see kind of what you have to think or take your questions. Um, I don't see a whole lot more growth in our workforce going forward. It, it's not anything any of us can do much about. This is just based on patterns that have already happened. They're unfolding now. Our demographics are moving us forward in this direction of a slow growing workforce, potentially a slow growing economy. And so it's our job to figure out what we do now that we have slower growth. What does it mean and what, what can we do better or differently now that we are uh, where we are today? For employers, um, it probably means that we need to work hard on making sure that every last person who wants to be able to work can work. And that may mean all kinds of barriers that we need to work on reducing um, going forward. Uh, also, employers are beginning to think about more flexible policies, contract work, remote work. The power that employers had in the past is kind of slowly shifting to employees. Uh, and it is incumbent on many employers to be thinking about what it is they need to do to kind of align with these new demands that workers have. 
Um, again, uh, migration may play an important part going forward, but it probably won't be a uh, full solution unless we see very different migration patterns than we've seen in the past. And so kind of looking forward, that's something that we'll be watching to see just what we, what we expect moving forward with, with migration. And so with that, do you have questions for me? And I wonder if I can go down and talk to you down there. I have a question for you. Can I talk to you down there? Oh, you have a microphone and everything. <laughs> oh, beautiful. Well, thanks for coming to speak to us tonight. Yeah, thanks for having me. We find this interesting. Um, I was talking to the folks at Brainerd Lakes Economic Development a couple of years ago and saying, what's with all these jobs that we have available? Everywhere you look, we're hiring help wanted, and yet there's still X percent unemployment, and how does that work out? And um, It was a long discussion, but the one thing I took out of it was they said you can't solve unemployment until you solve housing and daycare. You can't do one of the three. You have to do all three of them, and you kind of have to do it all at once. So my question to you is, these are great statistics. Are there people, decision makers, actually taking this information, and what are they doing with it? <laughs> what are they doing with it? Um, yes, there are people who take this information and even more specific information to try to get a better handle on the need for child care in particular. and Less so for me on housing, but I know housing is right up there with workforce issues. Um, so part, what I have witnessed in the 10 years in this job is, you know, I've been giving close to the same spiel about the fact that we are not, we're gonna have workforce shortages and that it's gonna be painful for a lot of employers. And here's some things you can do. And it kind of, People, they were so nice, but they would say, <laughs> they would say, yeah, that sounds scary. Um, it might not happen, though. It may happen, but that sounds strange. I don't think it's going to happen is essentially <laughs> the answer that I would get. Um, but now that they're experiencing some of the shortages, they're feeling the pain, I think it's become real in an all-new way in the last year. And I think some of the issues around housing, around child care are... Um, much more urgent to people. They understand where the bottleneck is now. <laughs> and so the, they, they understand using these numbers, the big picture, but they also use some of the census numbers and uh, Census Bureau surveys to um, figure out where families uh, need child care, what their capacity is to, to pay, pay for child care and still stay in the workforce. Um, so they use it kind of in that fine grain way and also a big picture kind of way as well. But I think what I've learned is it has to be really painful for it to be real and for it to be motivating. It just, it is what it is. I think we all act like that, right? All of us who put off our homework when we were in high school and college until we almost couldn't get it done, right? <laughs> Hi, Susan. We thank you again for having you. Um, so. I'm going to take a contrary um, stance on this and say people coming straight out of a high school and into college, how you're obviously experiencing low enrollment, low enrollment here at colleges, and are you anticipating that college going up in price is also affecting this low labor shortage, this, this labor shortage? <laughs> I think the labor force, the, the situation in the labor force right now is related to enrollment, but the way that it's related is probably what has kind of been true for some time, but especially true right now, is that when you have more opportunities in the workforce and immediate opportunities, it's really, really hard for a lot of people who may have very, very tight budgets to forego earnings to stay in school. And so I think. Right now, that's, there's a huge pull out of, uh, out of um, higher ed, I think, not just um, you know, uh, colleges, universities, just across the board, there's a pull of, of folks out 
because they have the capacity to work right away. I think that's more the experience that we're seeing right now. Um, and I mean, I think the, the co high cost of college just exacerbates that. Um, you know, maybe I'll get back to college when I can. What I've seen in response to high cost of college, employers needing more workers, is that um, training colleges and universities have worked more closely with employers, and employers have been more willing to be flexible to try to get people to train, to allow people to train as, as they're also in school. So maybe it's a closer relationship uh, between work, it, there's not a bright line between work and uh, school. Maybe it, it's starting to blend a little bit as we're seeing more of these, more of these pressures to pull people in. Hi there. Uh, thank you for coming out again. Um, Hi. That was a lovely presentation. Uh, so my question is, if we did lose our eighth seat, what do you think, how would it have affected Minnesota as a whole? It's a great question. I'm not sure that I'm equipped to answer it very well, but what I can, what I can tell you from the, the standpoint of a demographer <laughs> is generally less representation, less power for the state of Minnesota. The funding, I think, doesn't necessarily, the funding that we get from federal sources to the state of Minnesota doesn't necessarily hinge on how many seats you have, so that's not at issue. It's really just a matter of having that representation here and having much smaller districts, having communities, even, I mean, I'm, I'm sitting right now in a huge congressional district anyway, but it could have been, it could have been so much bigger. If you think, how many more, how far you would have to travel to encompass 100,000 more people. We're talking probably about the whole northern part of the state being one district. I mean, that's one way you could do it is the whole. So you would just have huge districts in the state of Minnesota um, if we went down to seven. Um, so I guess the practical um, outcome of that is just more concentrated power and representation that's closer to home, and that is closer um, connected to community needs, in theory. But someone in poli sci might be able to tell me something more specifically than that, too. <laughs> Hi, thank you for coming up here. Depending on where people get their news from, the traditional answer for the worker shortage People are lazy, people don't want to work, too many people do drugs, and it's obviously a lot more complicated than that. How come we don't see this being you know, told to people saying, there's just more people, they can retire, they don't need to work, and that's why we have a worker shortage? I hear that too, and I hear that that's what people believe to be true in some places, and. Honestly, I think the reason why that kind of has stuck is because during the pandemic, there were people who actually could choose to stay home. They had, um, they, they either had enough funds to be able to do that for a short time to stay out of the workforce. Some people retired early because of it. Um, you know, so there were some people who could make that choice to stay home. We heard about the great resignation for a while, so I think that put in people's minds, oh, people get to stay home if they want to. <laughs> um, there were, in, there were um, you know, federal funds to supplement income, so there were you know, extended unemployment for a while. Those things are no longer at play, and we're still seeing these shortages. When we look at the number of people in total in the state that are not in the workforce but are of working age, it's about 600,000 people. That includes people with disabilities who really can't work. Uh, it includes people who are in school full time. It includes uh, teenagers who are you know, 16 to 18 years old or in high school. Maybe they could work a little bit. Uh, but 
but many of them, it's about 50% of high schoolers uh, who work. Um, it includes people who have left the workforce because they have retired. And the vast majority of people who are not working right now are people who have retired um, and they're just you know, 60 years old and they had the great luxury of being able to retire or they had the great misfortune of having to retire because of some health event. Um, but there are not a lot of people on the bench anymore. And I think the reason why we hear about it is because for a time during the pandemic, there were people who chose not to work um, because, because they could or they needed to. That's, that's my take on why, on why. There may be other reasons too. Can you tell us what uh, impact Minnesota's lovely winter weather has on migration? <laughs> Getting less and less. <laughs> um, well, let me show you where people, I think I have slides that show you where people move. Oh yeah, oops. Okay, so we tend to swap the most people with the states that are nearest to us. So right at the top of the list, Wisconsin, North Dakota, um, we do, um, and, and the states that are nearest to us, our border states, are the people who tend to come here the most. So most of the movement when you migrate is among people you already know or short distances. Warm weather certainly is a factor for older adults who are migrating. Um, Arizona, California, Florida, top states for older adults leaving Minnesota. So that is certainly part of the picture. But if you think back to that graph that I showed you where it was very, very few people in their 60s and 70s and 80s that are moving compared to 18 and 19 or 20 year olds, I think most of the movement that is happening and mo is, is in states that are near and is among people who are of, of college age. And so if we want to understand why people are leaving, we should ask people who are, who know people who, I'm looking at you guys, <laughs> who, are, who are of the age to know people who have moved. Um, I, have, I have a kid who left the state to go to college. I'm gonna cross all my fingers and toes that she comes back <laughs> when she's all done, but that's a, that's a big reason why people move. Um, we do actually see movement back. There we go. This is for all the mothers out there who have uh, sent their kids off to college in other states, uh, people moving into Minnesota. So we do kind of see people coming back in these 20s and 30s. Many of them have lived in Minnesota or were born in Minnesota. They're returning after being away for a time. Um, but in terms of the, the weather being a factor, I would say it's, it's mainly a factor for older adults and it's a relatively small proportion of all our moves. Apparently all the important questions are taken, so. <laughs> what, what, why did you decide to become a demographer? What do you like about it? What's fascinating to you? Um, I'll tell you the story of the article that I read, and it is really a pretty good one because it's about divorce and explaining divorce. I don't know if it's, a, if it's real or not, but this is, this is what drew me to demography in the first place. So I was in graduate school, I read this article from a demographer in a population class that I was taking in policy school. And it said, you know, what has changed in the last 200 years as divorces have risen is that people are not living as long anymore. <laughs> and so, the, the length of time that people are married is about the same as it was 100 years ago, but they used to exit their marriages because they would pass away rather than because they would divorce. 
And so the theory was maybe marriage just has a lifespan. And maybe that lifespan is about 40 or 50 years. And after that, you know, there's, there's an exit from it. Now, I don't believe that. I'm going on 30 years myself of marriage. So <laughs> I don't believe that's the case. But what it did for me was it showed me that there's a whole nother set of factors that are shaping our everyday lives that we don't even know about. We didn't even think about the fact that in the past, our great grandparents were only married 20 years and that, you know, they didn't even have the opportunity to be, to be married 50 or 70 or, you know. So for me, it was what are the things that demographics open up for us or restrict for us that we aren't even aware of? Um, and so I just shared with you all what a nerd I am, but that's, <laughs> that's the thing that, that drew me to it to begin with, was, was that um, perspective that it brings that, that other disciplines don't. A paper on divorce. <laughs> Why do you think North Dakota has increased so much in their population? Because they're colder than we are, windier. It's oil. <laughs> it's oil. So it's mostly, uh, it's a couple things. First of all, it's very, very small. It's a very small state. And so to get to that really high percentage, we're talking about a quarter of the growth, so much less growth than Minnesota had in terms of numeric, numeric change. I think they added somewhere around 100,000 people in the last decade. Most of it was in the West. Most of it was where the fracking, the oil fields were. Um, so that was being driven by those economic changes in North Dakota. And the same with North Dakota, very strong economy, but also very small numbers, so much easier to get to those very dark colors on that map. So that's a little, the map's a little misleading um, if you're looking just at the percentages. The uh, trends that we see in Minnesota, are they nationwide? Uh, regarding employment and aging and so forth? So, we're hearing a lot about workforce shortages across the board right now, and a lot of that, most of that is being driven by aging, by retirement of the baby boom generation. Whether or not people acknowledge that or not is, is a question, but in my belief, <laughs> That's really what's driving, because the, ba the baby boom happened across the US, and so that generation is huge across the US. It's not one place or another. What's different is in some states you have more people moving in to make up for it. Um, in other states you have less of that. And Minnesota's kind of in the middle in that we have some m international migration uh, that's kind of bolstering uh, the growth um, but some rural states are much worse off than we are because they have no, no migration at all. Some states are better because they have more people uh, moving in to, to make up for some of those losses. But in all, we're in a period of aging, we're in a period of slower growth, um, and many places across the U.S. will be experiencing this, just not exactly at the same time or, or to the same degree. A question. Oh. No, I, mean, I, I, I actually have a, uh, maybe two questions okay. for you. Number one, early in your presentation, Susan, you talked about um, the census and the effect that it has on political apportionment across the country, that, and also on how that relates to how revenue from the federal government and or to governments is, is, is moved throughout the country. Yep. So my question is, how do leaders in, let's say, in rural Minnesota, um, when we look at the map and we look at counties that are having um, uh, reductions in population, we have people leaving, um, how, do, how do leaders in those counties look to access um, critical revenue to help take care of the needs of the remaining population that is there till 
let's say, death do us part right. um, in a morbid way. But um, in, in that sense of reality, um, because you still have that struggle for, for resources, for fiscal resources, but, but we also have that social responsibility to take care of our friends and neighbors and, and community. Any thoughts on that? It's a, it's a great question and it's kind of at the, it's one of the big questions as we move forward, um, how we will do that, especially in communities that are declining and that don't have the same kind of critical mass of people. Um, in terms of um, taking care of each other financially, we haven't been that great so far at doing that, right? We haven't shared in the, sa in, in the way that we need to. I don't know what the answer is. I can just say that we, will, we gotta figure this out, especially given um, where we're moving, that these trends in rural areas will exacerbate as aging continues to unfold. Um, and then, then we won't have as much growth overall to kind of outgrow some of the issues that we're making. Um, so I think uh, all I can say is it's a good and important question, but I don't know that I have the answer for how we align our values with the trends and with the situation that's kind of unfolding and the, the hardships that are unfolding in some communities because of these changes. So maybe I could follow this with a, maybe a more uh, a question uh, that's maybe a little bit more on the uh, positive side <laughs> because we have, uh, we have a great number of students here from the college that are in attendance tonight. Yeah. And so um, when we look at, um, when we looked at the unemployment numbers and we talked, uh, you talked uh, 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 a great deal on that and uh, at the opportunities out there. Um, if you were a young person, if you were, an, you and I were uh, uh, in our college years, now, would you not concur that there would be uh, a, a tremendous opportunity or advantages for young people right now that some of us that are, are far past that point, someone like me, maybe not you, but that uh, is past that point at um, a tremendous opportunities, career opportunities and earning opportunities um, at a younger age in, uh, in their career? Uh, would yeah. you would you concur with that? I totally agree. I think that it's much easier to get a job. The pay is higher. Uh, you have to have, the, as I said, you have to have those skills to be. You have to have something that someone's willing to pay for. So it's not we're going to give this job away to just anyone. We have to have the alignment of the skills. But it's it's um, not as much of a, um, a lottery kind of to get to land that job or land that good job. Um, so I would say kind of the opportunity for young people is twofold. One, for them personally, for you all personally, uh, in terms of earnings and doing really what you want to do. As long as you, again, as long as you have that skill, the opportunity is there. But the opportunity to put changes in, into play that you care about, so whether it's access to higher ed whether it's you know college affordability or m more equity for people uh, economically, there's there's more. I believe there's more opportunity to put some of the changes that you want to see put into play into play, because our demographics are so disruptive to us right now, or they will be so disruptive to us that we'll be looking for answers. <laughs> we'll be looking for how do we educate. Our young people, when we don't, when we can't find enough teachers, we'll be looking for, you know, what what is it exactly that? How do we need to set up our funding system so that we can care for more people in rural areas? I think our demographics will be and are beginning to be disruptive enough that we'll have more opportunities to put into play the things that we want to do. So. Personally, yes, but also if you have a pretty good idea of how things should be and they're not, 
you may just have that opportunity to put those into play in a way that we weren't able to in the past because things were going along okay, they weren't completely broken, things were still chugging along. Um, at some point here, something has to give with, with our growth numbers. We're gonna have to do things differently. So it's the bad news, but it's really the good news too. With all the challenges with the pandemic politically for the 2020 census, how accurate can we think these numbers are as far as reflecting the population? Um, the numbers were accurate for some groups and not so much for others. So we've gotten some information back that assess the accuracy of the census and in general, in Minnesota, we actually had a net overcount of people. Uh, so we counted more people here than we actually had. It sounds fishy, but what happens is people count college students in two places, or they count um, babies that weren't born by April 1st, or they count people who passed away before. Some of them are very honest mistakes. It's not fishy like, I'm gonna put down my son twice or something. That's not, I've never heard of anyone actually <laughs> doing that. So I just wanna say that. So we had a net overcount in Minnesota in general. The US had a very small undercount, very very small, like almost, almost zero. Um, but what we saw for some populations, particularly Hispanic or Latino residents, black or African-American and children under the age of five was a considerable undercount by about, I think it was around 5%. Um, so for some groups, those numbers are less accurate than they are for the, for the whole. That's true of past censuses, but especially um, this one, given so many of the disruptions. Questions? I'll just keep it. <laughs> I like As questions. you look over all these numbers, are there days you're surprised? Or is it kind of playing out the way it's expected? The surprises are kind of small surprises, if any. I'm never shocked. I would be a terrible demographer if I were ever shocked, because mostly these things move in a predictable way. Um, you know, Tom mentioned Tom Gillespie was in this job 32, 33 years before me. That's about 43 years of us jointly saying, guess what, in about 2020, there's going to be labor force shortages. <laughs> so this is not, <laughs> this is, the, the these trends move so slowly and so predictably that they're both easy to predict, but also there are very few times that I'm shocked. And when I am shocked, it's usually because there's been an error somewhere that we just have to go figure out where the error is. <laughs> Um, what I'm shocked by, what I'm really interested in is how people adapt to these changes. Those are the things that totally fascinate me because we don't have to do things the way we do. We just happen to be, I believe that we just happen to be doing things the way we do for whatever historical accident. So I think how we respond to these um, is wide open and, and that's my hope anyway. Hi. Say, well, thanks for coming. This has been a great presentation. Um, the total fertility rate in the nation's been dropping, right? It has. And you probably expect that to continue. It's been on a downward slide. Um, 2006 was, was the kind of height of, of fertility in Minnesota, and we've continued to see that decline, yes. So we're not going to get much relief from, from uh, new babies. <laughs> so if, if that's true, and we've got, we're top heavy with old folks, and I shouldn't say that since I'm one of them, um, and we've got a labor shortage that doesn't look like it's going to go away. I'm wondering if, if uh, the chambers of commerce and, and employers in general are beginning to think that maybe we should allow more immigration from, uh, you know, these countries that uh, really are uh, giving them up. Uh, they tend to be young. 
and healthy, and I'm sure you know that because you're a demographer, uh, and, uh, and good citizens. You know, their crime rate is less than the average U.S. citizen, despite what some politicians have said. And you've, I'm sure you know that too. <laughs> but uh, it, so are they beginning to be more willing to, to think like maybe we should be letting a few more people in here since we're a nation of immigrants anyway? Yeah. I'd say some have and some haven't. The Minnesota Chamber has been very vocal and very active in promoting immigration and trying to work on federal immigration reform. And the Minnesota Chamber historically has been more aligned with conservative perspectives, uh, but immigration, they understand just how important it is to their members, to employers, in order to continue to to keep our labor force going. Um, but that hasn't, we, we all know what the narrative around immigration has been for the last, you know, seven or so years that oftentimes we hear kind of the exact opposite about the, the benefit of, of immigration. And so what we need and what employers need doesn't always align with, with obviously the narrative, and I don't know why that is. <laughs> I just know that it's true. But I know that many employers are either individually seeking their own solutions through immigration, or they are advocating for more immigration um, at, at the federal policy level. I stayed at Breezy Point for um, a talk um, about a month ago and it was staffed by people who were from Jamaica, said their name, said, I'm Jim, or whatever his name was, and I'm from Jamaica, and I asked, how did you get here? What's the, what's the story? Why are, why are all of you from Jamaica? It's an internship program where they pull specifically people from, um, that are interested in the hospitality industry. They can get a special visa to work here for just one year, but they come here for one year, and that's what you know, one employer in, in your neck of the woods has done to meet this labor force shortage is to, to figure out how to take advantage of some of these programs that already exist, so. Um, I do have another question. You, you see, uh, you know, you're, you're developing all this information and I'm sure it's being used by the people who draw the lines. Do you get some input into drawing those lines uh, in terms of the districts? No, and I'm glad not to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, my role in the redistricting process was to talk to legislators about where the population had changed and how, um, but I had nothing to do with where the lines went. Fortunately, there's software that, that can help them. Tink well, the, the legislature legislators' plans didn't end up getting enacted anyway, but when they were making their maps, uh, when they were thinking about what they wanted to do, I really just talked about the trends and the numbers, but nothing specifically about where, where the lines would go. Have you developed an opinion about whether or not you think it's pretty fair or not? I can say relative to other places, Minnesota's system has been fairly fair, but it's also been enacted by the courts for the last several decades, so that may be why. I mean, we do, we do see compact districts here. We don't see strange snaking you know, like other states do. Um, so I would say that um, if you look hard enough, you may be able to find something that doesn't make sense or that's not fair, but generally what I see are things as you would expect them to see, kind of um, compact districts that don't snake for a reason that that has nothing to do with with um, uh, reason, I guess, re <laughs> a reasonable explanation like a like a topography or something like that. I can say Tom, who was before me, did tell me stories about having maps laid out across the whole floor of our office and a Sharpie marker to make some of the maps. So I know that there has been some involvement uh, by demographers in the past, but I think now that we have computers to do that, they just don't need us as much to like explain where exactly the population is. The, the mapping software can do that. We don't need our Sharpies anymore for the redistricting process. 
Do you have any uh, groups that don't want to be counted or are difficult to count? And are you able to count Amish people? How do you handle that sort of a challenge? So there are a lot of people who don't want to be counted. And there are a lot of people who are um, difficult to count for a number of reasons. Um, in the census, everyone is meant to be counted regardless of legal status. So unauthorized immigrants are meant to be counted in the census, but of course they're not going to be real keen on you know, filling out their form and telling the federal government where they are. So they're a group that's very hard to count. Um, it takes a lot of um, work with community members that they trust to understand that it's not something that's shared with, with ICE, with immigration. There are people who are really mobile, um, who move all the time. They're really hard to count, including college students are among the hardest group to count, um, especially those who live off campus. Um, you know, they don't think to, first of all, they don't think about, I know this for a fact, guys, I have a 19 year old. <laughs> they don't think, oh, I gotta fill out my census form, it's time. And they don't think, oh, should I count this person who's on my couch for the last two weeks? He's not staying here forever. He's just here until whatever other housing opens up. You know, so they're highly mobile, kind of unusual living situations. And it's not, there's not super clear boundaries about who should be on the form and who shouldn't be. So college students are up there. Groups that are distrustful of government may include, uh, you know, populations of color, but it also may include people who just don't like government and don't want to answer any questions. There's lots of people like that across the state. So that was, those were all challenges. Um, do they all get counted? Probably not, but there is, there are processes in place to account for them. Um, mail carriers are asked who lives in that house. Neighbors are asked how many people live in that house. And when all else fails, they go to administrative records like tax filings and that kind of thing too. So there's other ways to try to make up for it, but um, the preferred option is to have people fill out their form themselves. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm looking at your chart on in-migration and out-migration from Minnesota. Yep. How do we know that? Is, does that come off of census reports or, or what? So this is from the Census Bureau. They do an annual survey called the American Community Survey. And they ask people, where, where did you live a year ago today? So these are, these are people who said either I lived outside of the state of Minnesota and now they live there, or vice versa, they now live outside of the, the state of Minnesota and used to live here in a sense is an ongoing process, not just a one every, once every 10 years, the Census Bureau is doing kind of subcategories? So the Census Bureau is responsible for doing dozens of surveys. Um, this American Community Survey took the place of the long form of the census. And so it's all, has, has anyone in this room received an American Community Survey that you know of? about one in 55 households that get it in any year. And so this is an ongoing thing, but the decennial census where we take a full count of everyone only happens every 10 years. So that's still the same. It's, it's fewer questions, um, but this, this kind of social and economic and migration, all that kind of stuff is a longer survey. And if you get it, please fill it out and it'll take a while. I'm, I'm this guy's wife. Um, <laughs> no, I'm not going to let him have it. Um, I got to work. I retired in April 2020 and got to work for the census. Um, that was kind of one of the things I thought would be fascinating. And I did some special operations. I did transitory. Oh, in yeah. other words, the people that lived in Arizona and were headed back. Um, and then we worked around COVID. You know, you're on, you're off, it's, and then you're done, you're not done. Um, but yeah, finding people in group homes and campgrounds and homeless. Uh, did you say that we only got this district by 20, that we only got it by 26 people? Would you say you found 26 people? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. And these I were like people, I mean, it was just amusing, you know, <laughs> at these campgrounds. Yeah. It's like, 
No, we did it. You did it. No, I thought you did it. No, <laughs> neither one of them did it. Okay, here you go. You know, tracking people down, and uh, an another couple did it in Arizona, and their driver's <laughs> license was Minnesota, so I pulled them back. And uh, a lot of the employers have people um, housed. You know, I was up at some of the big resorts looking around in their housing. It, it was seek and find, and it was interesting. Um, but uh, a lot of my friends did the door-to-door -door stuff, and um, um, it sounds like a really good success that Minnesota had a lot of luck with online. In fact, a lot of my friends said, somebody's at my door, I already did it online. I mean, there was a lot of checking, checking, and rechecking. So I think it went really pretty well. But yeah, there were, there were people that didn't want to be found. And, yeah. and our, we kept, we, our time got cut short. It, October, yeah. Yeah, it was, we started late and got shut off early. I would like to thank you for your service to the state of Minnesota. <laughs> It's tough, it's messy. Counting people is, you think it's gonna be so easy because you just go door to door, but then you think of all the strange and different and wonderful living arrangements that people have and, and it's, it's messy. <laughs> Anyone else? Susan, thank you very much for coming. Oh, thanks for to having me, it's so good to be here.